Well, it is Father's Day. You know, a lot of fathers look like their sons or vice versa, and there's one. I would say that they pretty much, you can tell that they are father and son. Uh, we got another one, too. We got another one, too. There it is. It looks like the same person. And how about a third one? Yeah, you can see the smile, right? See the resemblance. And one more. Yeah, you can see that too. My, my daughter put something on Facebook, and we joke around all the time because I have some hearing loss, and if my wife was here, she'd say, no. But she's so supportive. Uh, but part of the hearing loss is really strange. It's, it's not that I can't hear it, I can't make sense of it, and there's a name for that. And apparently my daughter has a similar thing. So she had made a post on Facebook about how much she appreciates her parents and the lineage she comes from. And I almost typed back, what? <laughs> we have our little joke, I'm going to see her later today and I'll tell her we've talked about her. But uh, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, and there, there's some... From a picture, we can see similarities, but many times that similarity goes further than just appearance, right? Uh, my, my dad was one of 10 kids, and when we had family reunions, they all sat around and finished one another's sentences. They were so much alike. And I was thinking about my dad this morning, who's been gone for 25, almost 25 years. Hard to believe, but uh, how much I miss him. I think about him quite often. And uh, I'm grateful for the father that I had. Some people did not have a good earthly father, but thank God, huh? He is our perfect heavenly father. Yes. He is not like earthly fathers. He is perfect, and he loves us unconditionally. Well, we started this series, uh, Christ in the Old Testament, and uh, this is our third week, and we've looked at uh, different ways that we can see Christ in the Old Testament. And it's a beautiful thing, as I've explained, that, that we have the Word of God, which is not just a historical account of uh, 4,000 years of Earth's history written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different authors, but it agrees with itself. It proves itself. And there are more uh, prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament that either have been fulfilled or will be fulfilled with his second coming than, as they say, you can shake a stick at. There are, there, the, the odds of one person uh, completing even three of those, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, are 10 to the 17th power. One in 10 to the 17th power. That's just eight. And according to some people, there's 300 messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. So we looked at prophecy last week, and this week I want to look at another way that we can uh, rec recognize Christ in the Old Testament, and that is something we call typology. And this thing just went sleep on me. Typology. Uh, we speak of types of Christ, and all that means is uh, people or even things in the Old Testament that typify Christ, that, that aren't Jesus, but yet they are a type of Christ. And there's a, a lot of examples. You know, we talk about them looking like Jesus, not so much physically, like those fathers and sons that I mentioned, but in character and in nature, and they illustrate the nature of Christ. I, I mentioned things. It can be things. Noah's Ark is a type of Christ because the Ark delivered uh, the family to safety. Uh, the, the, the judgment of the world came in the form of a flood. Noah and his family escaped in the ark. So the ark is a type of Christ. Jacob's ladder in Genesis 28, where the angels of God were ascending and descending upon this ladder, Jesus himself confirmed that, that he is uh, this, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll actually do it now. Gospel of John. Jesus tells Nathaniel that he will see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So the reference was clear. Jesus saying he is that ladder. He is that connection between God and man. And Isaac, think about Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son, his only uh, God-given son, he and Sarah, 
He was willing to sacrifice Isaac, who did no wrong. And of course, God told him, stop, don't do that. So Isaac is a type of Christ. And also, we have Joseph, who was falsely accused and thrown in prison, and then eventually saved his whole family. So there's all kinds of types of Christ. We have Moses. We have the Passover lamb, uh, cloud by day, fire by night, as the children of uh, God uh, traveled through the wilderness, uh, the bronze snake that Moses held up, the, the temple veil that was torn, making a way for us to have access to the very holy of holies. Even the Sabbath day, the rest, the Sabbath rest is fulfilled in Christ because we have rest from our works, trying to gain favor before God. We have rest from that because Jesus fulfilled that Sabbath rest and we could go on. Today, I just want to talk about one person. One person that it's kind of fun to talk about him, it's fun to think about him. Uh, we know very little about him. But he appears in three separate uh, t uh, occasions and locations in the Word of God. The first time we read about him is in Genesis 14. Uh, then we also read about him in Psalm 110. And we read about him in Hebrews 5, 6, and 7. He's a man of mystery. We don't know a whole lot about him. But his name is, we don't need that, his name is Melchizedek. Yep, his name is Melchizedek. We'll get to that scripture later, but thank you. Um, so, aside from being a kind of a cool name to say, I want to look a little bit about why we say he is a type of Christ. He is a man who could be placed, arguably, in all three categories of Christ in the Old Testament. Prophecy, typology, and Christophany. The last one, eh, you know, it's people's opinion. Was he a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ? I don't know. Maybe he was. But certainly he fulfills the role of typology. Melchizedek, we see him in Genesis 14 where he is said to be the king of Salem. He's also called a priest. And a priest from the Old Testament sense is a mediator. Someone who stands between God and man and ministers to God on behalf of the people. Melchizedek is identified as a priest of God Most High, El Elyon. God Most High, not a God, but the God. So we know that he was a genuine priest to God and that he was a king of Salem. Salem is the old name for Jerusalem. Uh, Psalm 110 in David's messianic, one of David's messianic psalms, when David says, my, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my feet until I make your enemies a footstool. That psalm Later on in that psalm, David says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, if he's speaking of Jesus, the Messiah that is to come, and he's a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, we ought to have some idea of what Melchizedek is all about, right? Hebrews 5, 6, and 7, the author of Hebrews says, Jesus is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So if he's Melchizedekian, way to say that. We ought to have an idea about what this man is all about. So since he's broadly spoken of in three places in the Bible, even though not much is known about him, he earns an important place in types of Christ. Genesis 14, let me give you a little bit of context for when he appears. There were wars between kings. Abram had left his home and had heard the voice of God when God told him, go to a land that you've never been before, and I'm going to multiply you and make your descendants, descendants as numerous as the sand of the seashore and of the stars in the sky. Abr Abram obeys God before he was called Abraham. Abram obeyed God, traveled with his whole family, took a side trip to Egypt, because of a famine, and now he's come back into the land of Canaan. God blessed Abram and his nephew Lot so much that they couldn't handle the prosperity together. Think about this. They were so prosperous, and God made them so wealthy that in order to not trip over one another, they decided to go their separate ways. And Lot decided that he would head toward the east, 
and uh, he would go to the Jordan Valley, and Abram chose to stay in Canaan. So if you think that these patriarchs were poor, you're wrong. They were extremely wealthy because God prospered them because they said yes to God. Now, can we take that and twist it around and get way off base when it comes to prosperity? Absolutely. But just because a few bad apples end up in the bushel basket, let's not throw the whole thing away. God does desire and loves to prosper his children. The heart the heart of what to do with that prosperity is the key. We're blessed to be a blessing. Amen. So here's this war. These kings were fighting one another, and they had all these names that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Uh, but I, I challenge you to read it for yourself. But here's what happened. Here's when Abram got involved. Here's how Melchizedek got involved. Abram's nephew Lot was captured by one of these foreign kings. At the time, Lot was living in Sodom. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, cities that were destroyed a little bit later on. This was obviously before that. Lot was living in Sodom. Lot and uh, all of the people and the treasures of the, of the city were stolen and taken by a foreign king. So well, I just want to read a couple verses of Scripture, Genesis 14, 11, and 12. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions, and went their way. So Abram learned about this, formed a posse from his own household, 318 people, just from his household, not from a nation. This was the power that Abram had. He, he got a militia together of 318 people and went to get uh, the people back. They had gone north of Damascus, so Abram came in, took this posse of 318 people, went and got everything back. Uh, verse 17 says, after his return from the defeat of Kedor Laomer, there's a good name, name your next son that, Kedor Laomer, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So the king of Sodom comes out to, to greet Abram and thank him. This makes sense. If you read the first part of Genesis 14, you find out all of these kings by name are involved in this battle. So it makes sense that the king of Sodom would come out. But Melchizedek, bang, right there. No, no forewarning, no idea who this guy is. He almost get an idea that the first readers would have known who he was. It, it'd be like if you were around here and you said, uh, you know, go over to Middle Spring. And if you live around here, you go, oh, I know where Middle Spring is, right? The uh, gentleman, uh, Dodd, they call him, goes to the, the United Brethren Church. He's from, I think, Kenya, Africa. And I asked him one time, I said, where are you from originally? He said, Middle Spring. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I could tell by your Middle Spring accent. But anyway... It's like the people were reading or, or hearing this, they would have understood. But to us, we don't. He just enters the scene. We don't know anything about Melchizedek. But right away, his credentials are listed. He was the king of Salem, although there was no mention of Salem in the beginning of the chapter. There was no mention of him as a king as being involved in this battle. He obviously wasn't involved in this great war that had happened. But if Jerusalem uh, is Salem today, and if, if the if archaeologists have a pretty good idea where Sodom is, probably about 80 miles distance. So for some reason, Melchizedek had made the plan, because, you know, they didn't have Ubers in those days. He had made a plan to go to where this was. So you start to wondering, well, how, how would he know where to be? Uh, the kings were fighting against one another. He has this, uh, he's the king of Salem and a priest of El Elyon, 
the Most High God. And also, did you notice it says he brings out bread and wine? What does that remind you of? Reminds you of what we do the first Sunday of the month here, where we commemorate what Jesus did. So the priest uh, of the Most High God comes out bringing bread and wine, and then he blesses Abram. So he had authority to bless before Jesus, before Calvary, before Pentecost, before the Holy Spirit came to dwell in people. Priests were mediators. They had authority from God. You couldn't just grow up if you were not in the right lineage and say, I think I'll become a priest. It didn't work that way. You had to be of the Levitical line to serve in this capacity. But here's this guy that we don't know anything about. We don't know who, what, what lineage he is. We don't even know if he's Hebrew. We don't understand because Abram would have probably, you know, the first Hebrew, right? First time he's referred to as a Hebrew, it's Abram. So who is this guy? But he blesses Abram. So what is his role among all these nations? And, and why, if these kings were together, and, and Melchizedek was not involved as a king, why was he involved later as a priest? Moses included this fact when he wrote Genesis for a reason. Holy Spirit had him recount this for us today, all these years later. For us to have a little mystery about and to kind of ruminate about and say, who is this guy? And why does he just seem to appear out of nowhere? We know that he had authority both as a ruler and as a mediator between God and man. Abraham gave him a tenth of everything that he had reclaimed. Now, now listen, Abram later on said, I don't want any of the spoils. The king of Sodom went, wanted to give him uh, some of the, the items that were retrieved. And he said, no, I don't want it. But before all of that happened, he willingly gave Melchizedek a tenth. This was before the Ten Commandments. This was before the law. This was before the tithe was established as part of the law. And that's what tenth is. Tithe means tenth, right? And, and here, Abram, man, he, he tithed on the gross. He didn't have that conversation. Do I, do I tithe on the gross or on the net? He tithed on the gross. He said, a tenth of this belongs to you. Who was Melchizedek to receive a tithe? Hebrews, there's a parallel between Melchizedek and Jesus. and refers to the prophecy that I mentioned from Psalm 110. Connects the dots the whole way back to Genesis 14 and, and uses that phrase, in the order of Melchizedek. But the purpose in Hebrews is not to give you a history lesson. The purpose in Hebrews is not to tell you all about Melchizedek. The purpose in Hebrews is to show the qualifications of Jesus, to show how Jesus is the fulfillment of thousands of years of anticipation for Messiah who was to come. No lineage to explain what the author of Hebrews is saying, but that's exactly why the comparison. Jesus comes from the earthly lineage of King David, both in Mary and in Joseph, even though Joseph was his adoptive father. But Jesus has no lineage tracing him back to the priestly line. But yet Hebrews goes out of the way, uh, the, the writer goes out of his way to say that Jesus is our great high priest in the order of Melchizedek. In other words, no beginning, no end. No lineage. Uh, no lineage back to the Levitical line. Nothing that would qualify him by Old Testament thinking to be a priest. And it's saying that just like Melchizedek was a priest, without the lineage, so is Jesus. That he is our great high priest. This is not comparing Melchizedek with Jesus, because Jesus is obviously superior Jesus is the only man who ever lived on the face of the earth that didn't sin. He was the only one that had qualifications in just who he was to be everything for us. Yeah. Jesus' lineage is not dependent 
beyond the fact that he was a son of David in fulfilling that messianic prophecy, but in his, in his uh, ability as a priest to be a mediator between God and man, there is no one else. There is no one else. He's our only hope. But his priestly qualifications didn't come from the Levitical line. They came straight from heaven, just like Melchizedek. Guess what? God is God, and he can do whatever he wants. (laughs) That's biblical. You know that, right? Psalm 115, 3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Sometimes we can forget that, especially when he moves in ways that are just a little bit different. I can guarantee you, and I don't mean this to sound ill of anybody else, but there are churches in our country today that if we took that extra time to do what we did, be out the door, because after all, we're done at a certain time. It doesn't make you holy or better than anybody. I'm just saying that God can do what He wants. And who are we to tell him that he's not following our rules, right? Also know that you can extend something beyond God's already left, found a place to eat lunch, and you're still here. I understand that too. Uh, Great wisdom from a pastor one time when I was on the road in itinerant ministry. I said, when are you used to getting out of the service? He said, when you're done, quit. Not before and not after. So that's a good rule of thumb also. So I won't do any more rabbit trails. We'll get back to it, okay? But anyway, God has the authority. It it doesn't mean that God contradicts himself. It just means that he has leeway to do things any way he wants to. And and, and because we're we're humble before him, we have to give him the right to do what it is that he wants to do. In the case of Jesus' uh, priestly qualifications, God himself, in the person of Jesus, became the mediator. Huh? Hallelujah. God loved us so much that he said, I'm going to come down there, and I'll become one of you. Wow. Talk about humbling himself. This is the God that created everything. This is the God that, that has the, 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 the eternity, past, present, and future right in the palm of his hand. He loved us so much that he became one of us. Now we can put that scripture up, Anna. Hebrews 5, 7 to 10. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Think about it. He cried out to the one who would have been able to save him from death because in his humanity he experienced fear and anxiety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So it's not so important for us to know all about Melchizedek, but it is important for us to understand that God in His eternal wisdom and plan has given us examples that we can follow so that we can better understand what it is that Jesus accomplished for us. That we don't get caught up in just the the pat answers. You know, Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sin. And that may be true, and it is true. But for us to understand more of a character and nature of a God who would go to these lengths, and what are the lengths that he went to? And what is Jesus? What has he fulfilled? What has he accomplished? What can we look at the Old Testament and look at what Jesus happened and consider all of the things that he fulfilled that God put as plans, uh, uh, events, the Passover, right? Think about the, the Jewish feasts that were initiated then the majority of them were fulfilled when Jesus went to the cross. Some are yet to be fulfilled when he comes again. God didn't just do things because he just wanted to do something different. Everything had a plan and everything had a purpose. 
And Jesus is our eternal high priest. No beginning, no end. He will always be our mediator. God's given us types. He's given us some lookalikes to help us better understand. Furthermore, it's entirely within New Testament teaching that we are to become like Melchizedek for others. We are designed to be types of Christ. There are people that will never open the Bible and will never come to church, but they can see in you something different. That God has planned in his foreknowledge, which I don't understand either, someday maybe I will, but that's part of the mystery, that we could be changed, that we could become new creations, that we would not react and act the way that the world does who doesn't know Jesus. And in that, we're a type of Christ in the way that we respond and the, the priorities that we have and what elevates our desires, what we give our money to. Abram gave a tenth to some, some guy that we don't even know about. And meanwhile, we're, we're worrying about all the details. Are we still under the tithe? And I always say, well, it's a good start. He wants, us, he wants everything. He wants all of us. And for that matter, if we learn to live without a tenth, it helps us to be, live very disciplined lives. How many of you know that in the times where you didn't think you had the money to pay your tithe? It, let, me not call, let me not say that. Let me not say that. I don't think we should pay our tithe. I think we should give it. We think, how are we going to make it? And then you find out that we can't afford not to, right? Yeah. You can't outgive God. That was an extra little tithe message. That's no charge. But we're to emulate Jesus. We're to be like Jesus. And sometimes I think if you say that, people think you're crazy. Yep. And they start giving you all the reasons why you can't be like Jesus. What, what happened? Was there no Calvary? Was, was there no Pentecost? Is not the Holy Spirit available yes. to, to purify us and make us holy yes. and sanctify us completely? Yes. Are we going to be perfect? Of course not. Because we're not Jesus, but we are emulating Jesus. The Apostle Paul, man, if anyone, if anyone would be able to say, I lived like Jesus, it would be Paul. But what did he say? He said in 1 Corinthians Chapter 11, verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. That means follow me in the same way that I follow Christ. Do, do you see the difference there? He's not saying that he is perfect, but he is kind of putting the pressure on himself, right? If maybe pressure isn't the right word, the responsibility or the duty or the understanding that he can follow Christ. So he's not saying, do everything that I do. He's saying, follow me as I follow Christ. What does that mean? Our actions, our reactions. How many besides me would say that's a tough one? Our priorities, our focus, our servanthood. Stop saying I so much. Mm -hmm. Our servanthood, our authority. Mm -hmm. We exercised our authority in Christ this morning. And I believe God was pleased that we exercise our authority in Christ because we are who He says we are. Yep. Right. How about purity? Single mindedness, generosity the way we love one another, with the way we love people who don't love us. Yeah, really starting to bother you now, right? How about with our patience, how patient we are, realizing that God has been patient with us. 
Good thing we're not left on our own merits to exhibit these traits, huh? It's a good thing that we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit and we can be infilled by the Holy Spirit if we choose to let Him have control of our lives. If you want to be like Jesus, you want to be a type of Christ, you got to spend time with Him. It has to be your daily experience, not just your devotions where you take a few minutes to read a couple of verses of Scripture and pray and at mealtimes, thank you for this food and the hands that prepared it. Always, we only bless the hands. Why is that? I don't know. We ought to bless the rest of the person that prepared it. Um, but a pursuing, a, a seeking God, seeking His face, stands to reason. The more time you spend with Him, the more you're going to look like Him have times to simply be in His presence. And that doesn't have to look any particular way. But I'm telling you what, if you purpose to carve out times where you say, Lord, I just want to sit in Your presence, you don't have to say a word, you don't have to raise your hands, all the stuff that we think you have to do, just rest in Him. He'll speak to you. I'll speak to you. If you're like me, the hardest thing is to stop your mind from thinking about all the things you have to do. Mm-hmm. Let's make a commitment to experience the mysterious. We don't always have to have answers. Let's get blown away by the mysteries of God. Psalm 27, a psalm of David. He wrote, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You've said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. We're not going to accomplish that sitting in here on Sunday morning. You've heard, well, Brother, you were here 17 years. I'm sure you repeated yourself too. So I've been here going on five, and I've already repeated myself. (laughs) You don't get close to Jesus by making statements like, we need to be closer to Jesus. You don't have revival by saying, we need revival. There ought to be more people in church on Sunday morning. Where are you? And, and is the end all being in church? Isn't the end all being the church? I'd love to see this place filled. I said yesterday, I'd like to see this tomorrow morning. It, it's getting there. But that's not the ultimate goal. If you're going to be part of what God has in store on a larger scale, it's going to take more than just listening to some guy talk for 40 minutes. It's going to be more than just watching somebody else do the praying. It's going to be more than just singing the songs that somebody else wrote and performs. It's seeking His face. It's coming before Him and saying, I so want to be involved in the move of God that I'm willing to shut down some other things and just come and look upon his face. I'm going to ask you this morning if you'd like to do that. I know we spent some time at an altar, but I'm going to ask if you'd like to do it again. Let's just take a few more minutes. What do you think would happen? You know, we like to talk about people, you got to stick to it, right? That's good old German way of thinking, right? We're going to persevere. We're going to work hard. We're going to stay with it. What if we stayed with it like five more minutes? What, what if when we get up to that point where we're just so weary and tired, if we went that much further? A- ask a runner when they train to run. and I'm not one, especially maybe I was a few years ago. What do you do when you're training yourself? You push When it hurts, you push harder. And the thing of it is, when in our relationship with God, we're not pushing in our own strength. We're just simply availing ourselves to what He's already made possible. We think what happened if if we went that much further, 
if we gave of ourselves that much more, if we trusted him that much longer, if we stayed with it, if we sought his face no matter what we were going through, 